Nassau Flyers, Long Island's leader in flight training and airplane rentals, is an authorized Husky aircraft dealer and Cirrus certified training center, producing safe, proficient pilots for over 35 years. Located in Farmingdale's Republic Airport, Nassau Flyers experience certified flight instructors train pilots to be the best in the sky by equipping aviators with valuable aeronautical decision-making and airmanship in a well-maintained fleet of airplanes from new LSAs to new current generation Cirrus SR-20s and SR-22s. Visit flynfi.com. Hi, Dave. Thanks for coming to Savvy Central Radio today. How are you? Very good, Christina. Pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on. I loved your talk that you gave at the beginning of October at Republic Airport. You talked about some of your wonderful experiences as being a pilot and an aviator in the cockpit and some of your lessons you've learned. I'd love if you start by telling the audience a little bit about you and how you got into the world of aviation and aerobatics. Uh, sure. I started uh, flying against everyone's knowledge and wish at a very young age of uh, 14. I was living in Brooklyn and I used to basically sneak out early on Saturday morning, a combination of subway and Long Island Railroad and a taxi cab, a small airport that used to be in Amityville called Zons, which is no longer there. And I used to put whatever money I pulled together from working for the week and use that for a flying lesson. Sometimes it was as short as 30 minutes, sometimes it was uh, closer to an hour. And then I sold it on my 16th birthday. I had to wait until I was 17 to get a license. It was pretty boring just flying around and started, I guess, as an outlaw exploring aerobatics. And by the time I had my license, I already had quite a bit of aerobatic experience. The aerobatics grew. Later on, 1987, I started getting serious. I bought an aerobatic airplane. With that, I climbed the ladder into competition pretty quickly. I started winning local contests. And then I progressed into more and more complex airplanes and then eventually wound up with a seat on the United States aerobatic team in mm. 2000. Mm, very impressive. And I'm loving what you're saying there about getting ready to go out to the airport and taking the train, the bus, and the, and the, and the cab. I can totally relate. I live in Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn myself, and would come out with all my flight gear and take the train to Long Island uh, Republic Airport and then take the cab. And I started out actually at Caldwell Airport and would get off there at the bus stop and walk a mile with my pillow and all my flight gear. So I'm sure a lot of people and folks out there who live in the cities who have to hike on over to the airport would be able to relate to you. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So David, when you said you uh, were getting into aerobatics before you even got your license, how would you go about that? Would you take it pretty high up in the air and just practice a bit and kind of, you know, feel it out and learn bit by bit? I mean, how did that work out for you? My first experience, I guess it's looking back, it was kind of a funny experience to talk about. First aerobatic maneuver that was ever done was actually out of a small airport, which was after Zons had closed. I didn't get my license out of Zons. It was actually out of a small airport called Bayport, which is still there, a, a, a grass field in Bayport, Long Island. And I was bored flying around just waiting for my 17th birthday. So I wanted to get checked out in a Piper Cub, a small two-seat uh, 1940s vintage aircraft set up for aerobatics or anything, but uh, very low powered and a tail drag or fun to fly. And the instructor I had, had taken me up. And at that time, it was no big deal to get checked out in a conventional gear aircraft. Unfortunately, today it's turned into a whole process. But back then it was maybe 30, 40 minutes of some landings. And he said, you're fine. Um, you're good to go, but we need to put an hour in or the lady who owns the flight school is going to yell at him because he checked me out too soon. So we went out over the south shore of Long Island, and he said, I have the airplane for a second. And he dove down, and he got up to about 100 miles an hour, and he went ahead and executed a loop. And I was really excited. I thought it was one of the greatest things I've ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. I asked him if I could try it, and he says, no, absolutely not. It was illegal. It was something that was completely something that we weren't supposed to talk about. We went back to the airport and I was checked out. He signed my logbook, put fuel in the airplane. For me, it was the airplane, no, no starter. So he hand propped me and I took off. And instead of doing landings, I went out to the South Shore to do a loop. Mine wasn't so successful. <laughs> my first loop was exactly what he did, 100 miles per hour. And I pulled up from about 1,500 feet. And I didn't have enough G on the upside of the loop. And I got to the top and everything went bad. Uh, airplane mm -hmm. ran out of speed 
and basically stopped. And I wound up on the negative G and about 30 or 40 years worth of dirt from the floor fell and, you know, came up and hit me in the face. I was hanging from a seatbelt, motor shut off, fuel was pouring out from the gas cap, oil was coming out from the breather and the prop stopped. So I was sitting there pretty scared. And eventually I got the nose to kind of wiggle over and finish the loop. And on the downline, the prop started to rotate just from airflow over the propeller. And eventually some black smoke came out and some coughs and funny noises. Motor got running again. And the whole airplane was covered with oil and I was covered with dirt. And I went back to the airport shaking. I landed, instructor walked over, looked at me, looked at the airplane, just started laughing because he knew exactly what happened. But um, put gas back in the airplane, went back out to the South Shore, and I did a loop. So mm-hmm. that was my start of aerobatics, and it's never stopped since. Mm, yeah, it's, it's that getting over. I'm amazed that a lot of people would ended it right there and said, oh, that was too scary, not going back. But you realize that everything takes practice. It didn't happen overnight. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Well, what I love, and I'm sure you've gained this over many years of flying as well as doing aerobatics, is many lessons you've learned in the cockpit. And what would you say is one lesson you've learned in the cockpit that we could apply to life or business? It's a great question. I'm (laughs) doing this in a quick thought through my head. I would say one of the best lessons is when things really get tough, the worst thing you could do is to panic. And that's the time when you really need to slow things down, put them in perspective, and figure out how you can use whatever knowledge you have, apply it to the current situation, and uh, make the best out of it. Mm. So uh, when you get to panic mode, really slow down deeply to sig- figure out, okay, what, do I, what are my tools right now that I can use to make this happen and turn it around? Correct. What I've found is when things seem like they're going really quickly, mm-hmm. there's usually a problem. When things are going well, it seems like it's in slow motion. And that's really the way it should be. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to remember. And I find the thing is when things start to go wrong, that's when you want to go 20 million miles an hour trying to fix it. But that's exactly the wrong thing because you're just going to make more and more mistakes on top of it and probably get yourself in deeper problems. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So slow it down, take your time, figure out what the issues are, what skills you have at your disposal, and then take it from there. Great, great advice. Yeah, so David, uh, uh, throughout your whole life and and becoming an aerobatic champion as well, what has been some of your biggest hurdles or challenges along your way, and how did you overcome them? I think some of the biggest challenges in aerobatics is, and from what I understand, it's very similar to golf, although I'm not a golfer. uh, You can have a day when you are the best of the best, and everything is just working absolutely perfectly. And you think you have it down pat and have it under control. And then you go out there the next day and everything just went down the tubes. You can't understand why. And then you have to figure out how to deal with it. And that's really a a major challenge in aerobatics. And again, like I said, from what I understand from some pretty intense golfers, very similar in that sport also. So being able to deal with the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs and learning how to uh, basically emotionally control yourself to not get upset with the, the bad times and be able to put yourself back together again. Mm. Those are some good tips there, David. And I can agree. For me, it's very interesting. When I have everyday kind of struggles or stresses come up at my job and working in corporate finance for many years, and I would go, like you had mentioned, 100 miles an hour, I would start freaking out. It would seem like there were no solutions available. The minute you slowed down, the, it's amazing how the solutions would just pop right into view. A couple of years ago, I was out flying with a friend, and the engine, not the engine, excuse me, the electric systems went down. So it was a glass cockpit, so all the computers went dead. And I, immediately thinking from years of being in a stressful environment in corporate, said, okay, there's got to be a checklist for this to fix it. So I just pulled out the nearest checklist and started going through it. What can we do to reboot this puppy? And my friend, who was actually the pilot in command, said, I love the fact that you didn't freak out and you just pulled out a a checklist to figure out how you could help me. And instead of freaking out like a passenger next to me going, oh, my God, get us off the ground now. But that's exactly what you have to do in life is that, you know, if you're going to freak out, you're just going to get nowhere. Correct. Yeah, totally. Well, that's awesome, David. And what would be your top number one safety tip you give to any pilots out there, regardless of age or experience? I think that every pilot at some time early in their flying endeavor should get some sort of aerobatic training, Mm -hmm. not necessarily to follow through with aerobatics, but at least to understand that 
every aircraft in the sky doesn't know the ground from outer space and it doesn't know up from down. It just flies through the air. So it's capable of winding up in an inverted position or a knife edge position or anything else that you could possibly imagine. So since it's capable of rolling 360 degrees, pitching 360 degrees, every pilot should at one point in their career have been through all of the possible attitudes that an airplane can wind up in and be comfortable getting back to level flight where they're comfortable again. So I, that would be my number one suggestion. Hmm. I, I think that's fabulous advice. There was a, a guy I talked to not too long ago. He's a Navy pilot, and he, after exiting the Navy, he entered into the majors working for a major airline. And he said he was really confused because he thought everyone had extreme attitude training in because he started straight all his aviation training straight in the military. So he had no idea that this extreme attitude flying and different strange, you might say, attitudes was what all pilots went through in, in general civilian training. And he quickly found out that not, that was not the case. So he went about setting up a flight school that just focused on unusual attitudes and stuff like that, getting pilots trained. And his whole mission is to really let pilots know that, you know, you don't have to become an aerobatic pilot per se, but you don't want one day to be out with your family and you, un you end up upside down and you can't take care of the situation. Sure. I can give you a bit of, of history that is really interesting in that line. I, many years ago, started giving pilots flight lessons that work for a major airline. I chose not to mention that airline's name at the mm -hmm. current time. And they would send people out to me in a pits and I would take them for a ride. Mm -hmm. And these are people with tremendous amount of hours and experience in airplanes. And what I would do consistently is take them up to about 2,000 feet over the beach and roll them inverted mm -hmm. and hand them the airplane, control of the airplane. And I can tell you 100% of them, you know, this one run had to be about 25 plus pilots, would pull on the stick from inverted at 2,000 feet to try and get back to level flight. And that's guaranteed death. It's a split S and you take any large aircraft and try and split S from 2,000 feet. Uh, you won't even make it to a vertical downline before you hit the ground. And all they needed to do was just roll out of it but their natural sense is, is telling them to search for positive G to push themselves back in the seat to get that great feeling again mm -hmm. of positive G and pulling on the stick will give you that sensation temporarily until you hit the ground. And after teaching these people how to roll out of that maneuver, which is as simple as it can be, they felt like they have just conquered the whole new aspect of flying and safety. This episode today is brought to you by Nassau Flyers, Long Island's leader in flight training and airplane rentals. Visit flynfi.com. Mm. And that reminds me, David, to my training and learning um, stalls for the first time. The particular aircraft I was in was, I think, a P-model Cessna. But this particular Cessna seemed to break quite hard from our practice stalls and such, on and off stalls. And stall just means, guys, that the wings stop flying for a bit and because of not enough wind flow can come over the wings. And the first time it did that, I just totally let go of all the controls and was like, ah! But that's, And then the second thing I did when he said, put your hands back on the controls, is I wanted to pull all the way back really hard and make, make us go into a secondary stall because I, couldn't, I wasn't allowing the airplane to recover, allow wind to come over the wings so that I could recover and I could keep flying. Instead, I got so scared, I pulled all the way back and, and caused it to go into a further, deeper stall. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, David, because we will often do what feels natural, but it actually actually kill us in the long run. Correct. Or in the short run, actually. <laughs> Absolutely true. Well, well, thank you. That is some awesome tips there for anyone who's interested in becoming a pilot or who is a pilot, what you can do to get yourself safe and make sure you never end up dead at the end of a flight or, or such. What would you say for anyone out there, Dave, who is interested in entering the aviation industry, whether it's just being a pilot, mechanic, or air traffic controller, what's the top advice you would give them for that if they just want to enter into the aviation industry besides safety, that is? Uh, I think that people need to sit down and, and do some soul searching and figure out what area they feel that they have a natural ability mm -hmm. to excel in. You said air traffic control, and I've 
run into some incredible air traffic controllers that just have the ability to multitask and be concentrating on multiple things at the same time. And although I feel I'm a quite accomplished pilot, in my wildest imagination, I could not sit at the desk that they were sitting in uh, multitasking like they were doing. And then they would tell me that they can't imagine flying like I fly. So there is one area uh, I'm sure that people could find in aviation where, where they can truly say that they have an ability to excel in and bring some really good things to the table for other people. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, that, that's a great advice there. I, many years ago, uh, upon entering or leaving high school, decided, hey, maybe I'll enter into the world of air traffic control. It sounded like a, a really exciting career. Uh, for me, it just wasn't going to work. And I like that you mentioned the multitasking of it because they do so much work that we don't give them credit for our air traffic controllers. Sometimes I find pilots aren't, they kind of garble their message to them and, and have little patience for them and sometimes vice versa sometimes air traffic controllers can be a little bit more patient for the pilot up there working everything by themselves but what they do down on the ground is nothing but amazing and I'm really grateful for them but the other part of the job which I didn't know until I started talking to air traffic controllers is the extreme stress of if you have hundred or more than a hundred aircraft to take care of up there and make sure they don't crash into one another because anyone's lives you have at your hands are, is going to be something you're going to have to deal with. So that's another amazing thing that they deal with high stress and really multitask to the extreme. Yeah, you, you can't go into a holding pattern and you can't just turn your computer off and come back to it 10 minutes later. It's nonstop. And the, the, one airplane lands, there's another one right behind him. So they have an extremely difficult and, and um, stressful job doing it. And most of them are incredible at it. Amazing job. Yeah, but they really put them through the ringer. I think you're in the, how long is it? I think for at least three years, you're on probational period where they're really having supervisors check out your work, making sure they really you really know what you're doing. And they always have a supervisor looking at new folks in the industry to make sure they're doing it correctly and, and whatever. So you're not just let on the leash once you've been trained. It's really highly monitored and safety oriented. Yeah, if you had a stressful day at home or a stressful day in your own personal life, you come to work, you need to put all that mm -hmm. on the side and, and have a clear head for what you're about to take care of and, and the work end of it. Yeah, and once I talked to a number of air traffic controllers, I, I began to see that this indeed would not be the career for me, but it's good that you mentioned that to really get a handle on each of the different areas of aviation, see which one best meets your personality and your skill set. Sure. So... Dave, who has been some of your greatest role models along your journey? One name pops into mind. I don't think that there was a better pilot that I know of in my lifetime. Uh, Leo Loudenslager. Mm. So he was uh, the man. Mm. And what about him inspired you in particular? He had not only an incredible ability to fly, but he was also an aerodynamic engineer. Mm -hmm. Built his own airplane. He designed his own airplane. He basically created the modern-day monoplane in aerobatics, which although to a lot of people, they look at it, it looks almost like a toy. In reality, it's probably structurally and aerodynamically the most complex airplane flying right now. Uh, it's like a Formula One racer for the sky. And people who know about driving and cars know that F1 is really the baseline for technology in all automobiles and everything that comes out in new cars that we drive as far as handling and performance was designed and created because of F1. The same thing with flying and our aerobatics. So his ability to create this monoplane, uh, Leo's ability to create this monoplane was really what started the whole modern evolution of aerobatics and allows people to get airplanes to tumble and somersault and backflip and all the things that People get to see in air shows, which in some minds, it's just a crazy pilot out there. But in reality, the complexity of the aerodynamics through some of those maneuvers uh, is something that even a computer today, as great as they are, can't duplicate in simulation mode. Mm. So that my hat's off to him for that. He also he won the world championship in 1980 in aerobatics. He won the United States national championship seven times. Wow. Spectacular. So wow. he was my role model. That is amazing. And I'm just totally blown away. I heard you doing a little talk on gyroscopic maneuvers and such. I was like, what? 
And I was like, planes can do that? Because I know what a gyroscope, gyroscopic or gyroscope. gyroscope, duh, is. But I was like, how does that apply to flying? And when you were talking about how the prop can be used as a gyroscope and it spins through the air, I was like, whoa, that is just amazing. And that's rather new to aerobatics, or is it not? First gyroscopic maneuvers that I'm aware of were from the Czechoslovakians mm -hmm. in the mid-1980s in their first monoplanes. Uh, and the maneuver that, that everyone, today we just refer to them as tumbles, but the name for that maneuver was devised by Czechoslovakia and it's called Lumkovac, and it basically means out of control. The first time anyone saw an airplane tumble, uh, they thought it was out of control. And initially they were out of control. And today we've gotten to the point where we can tumble an airplane on almost any axis, break out of it at any point, point it in any direction and start all over again. Mm. And that's one thing I don't think a lot of people understand about aerobatics because I've seen some YouTube videos of kids who are just going out there, have gotten their license and they're thinking, I'm going to go and do some aerobatics like I saw on YouTube. And this is extreme sport that takes a lot of technique and a lot of practice. I mean, I've heard Patty Wagstaff say that she goes out for a total of six hours a day, two hours, two hours, and two hours, and is beating up her entire body to get this perfect. So it's not like, poof, go out there, do it, and it's up, you can do any of these maneuvers. This takes a lot of practice and training. Thousands and thousands and thousands of flights. Yeah, yeah. To reach unlimited today. Really, to get to the top, it's five or six days a week, three to four flights a day, nine to ten months per year, mm -hmm. nonstop. And you, you really don't go 24 hours ever without flying. So I just want to make that clear to anyone who thinks they can just go out there and do what they see Dave do on some of these videos. He takes a lot of training and practice for many, many years he's been doing this. And for the monoplane you mentioned, would edge, the edge plane be one of the ones you're talking about, top-of-the-line aerobatic planes today? A absolutely. There are basically three, air well, I want to say three to four airplanes that are capable of unlimited today. The market's changing tremendously, but uh, there's a company called Extra in Germany that had built airplanes for a long time, and there's always a race to have the best airplane. They're one. Uh, second one, which has been phenomenal forefront, built in the United States in Guthrie, Oklahoma, is uh, Zifco who builds the edge mm -hmm. and the Russians have an airplane, which really is not produced anymore. There's still quite a few around, which was an incredible airplane. And, um, that's called the Sukhoi. Mm -hmm. Those are the three that are currently you know, available. Uh, the French have an airplane. I don't believe it's produced anymore. Mudry aviation called a cap mm -hmm. three, two. And then, uh, the last one, it was a U.S. company, but they're not producing them anymore. So I'll leave that out. But, Really, those four are the, the only potential planes for competing in Unlimited. Mm -hmm. And like I said, only two of them are currently still in production that I know of. Oh, awesome. Well, Dave, what would you say as of this moment has been your greatest achievement or accomplishment in your life? Greatest accomplishment? You're talking about flying? Oh, any, anything. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be flying. Oh, five children. Ah. <laughs> I would say five kids would be the, the number one accomplishment. God bless them. Are any of them following in your footsteps? Two of them are flying. Just got his license when he was 17. The other one is still 16. And he soloed. Hopefully he'll have his license by the time he's 17. Uh, the one underneath him is also flying. He's only uh, 14 right now. Mm -hmm. He's a great pilot. The other two I'm not sure about. They're still pretty young. Yeah, yeah. So what's on the horizon for your business in the next year or so? Business, I have a water bottle that I'm trying to bring to market that will basically hopefully eliminate the majority of the disposable water bottles that are out there right now, wasted plastic and landfill consumption that's going on. It's a great system where a bottle, you plug it in and it kind of fills itself up with uh, chilled and filtered water that we find to be better than almost any bottled water you can buy. Mm -hmm. And it's called Water Filler, and uh, working hard on bringing that to market and trying to change the whole system of how people drink water. Oh, I love that. And we must have you on again when that's up and rolling and to get, help you get out the message on that. 
because one guy we had on last month, David Cajel, is all about green architecture and how to live more green and, and work it into your life, you know, not only just electric cars and such, but really to go much deeper and, and getting away from carbon usage and such. So, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have you on talking about that. And if anyone would like to find out more about your services, either as a pilot or any of the other exciting things you have going on, how might they make contact with you? Well, I have a website set up, and it's windmiller.com, W-I-N-D-M-I-L-L-E-R.com. There should be a link to the water filler bottle on that also. Definitely contact for me. Awesome. Well, thank you, David, for coming on today and sharing your amazing expertise and your wisdom and coming on Savvy Central Radio. Thank you so much. Christina, with pleasure. Thank you for having me. Join us this Friday, November 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, where our guests will be John and Rose Dorsey, Wisconsin native pilot, will share with us the rich aviation history of Wisconsin. Hi, it's Teresa DeGrobo here. I am so excited to be coming to New York with Christina Nichman and mastering the Influence Game series hosted by Savvy Central Radio. I am going to be speaking on how to become a master at the Influence Game. We're going to really dive into how do you get that stampede of customers that are really anxious to buy your products and your services. And what are the really critical steps you have to take to be really successful in connecting with the high-level influencers? How do you get past the gatekeepers and have them take you seriously and really want to play with you. We're also going to talk about the power of a best-selling book, why it's your top marketing tool, and I'm going to tell you the insider secret formula for how you can get there quickly. Looking forward to seeing you. To find out more, go to masteringtheinfluencegame.eventbrite.com.